Coming up from my last video, Lord knows how long ago that was. While studying the topic, I came to realize something quite interesting. Neutronium bombs sound cool but are next to impossible to make. I mean, there's just no way to gather enough neutrons to make a bomb. So, my dear viewer, you can relax. Nuclear and thermonuclear bombs, on the other hand, are quite easy to make. Well, if you somehow get your hands on some uranium and plutonium, then it becomes easy. Although the topic was based on pure fiction, one question came to mind while I was studying the Tsar Bomba. How were they able to achieve 50 megatons? Hello everyone, Subject Zero here. At the end of the Second World War, two atomic bombs were dropped in Japan. Little Boy with 15 kilotons of TNT equivalents and Fat Man with 21. They were the first and only atomic bombs to be used in warfare, killing an estimated number of in between 120 to 160,000 people. Something that should never happen again. Now, the way these bombs worked, although you could say that they were state of the art during their time, had a lot of drawbacks. Seriously, not only their design was so simple, which makes me wonder why the Germans never figured it out, they also could easily be disabled. If only the Japanese knew about it, but I digress. To understand how they were able to achieve a 50 megaton bomb, we first need to understand how it all works. The principle behind how fission and fusion bombs work is straightforward. For fission to occur, essentially you need fast-moving neutrons to collide with the nucleus initiating a chain reaction. This is a major problem. Hitting the nucleus is really hard, especially with fast neutrons. In most reactions, neutrons are lost if nothing keeps them at bay. To help, they use something called temper. A temper makes sure that the fast fusion neutrons released by the hit bounce back, continue the chain reaction. But all of this has to happen in a fraction of a second to release all of the energy of the bomb. Hence why these devices are so precise down to the microsecond. There are mainly two ways to ignite the core, and both of them were explored during the Second World War. The first most simple method was used with Little Boy version of the bomb. It is the simplest way to ignite nuclear fission. This bomb used a ballistic approach to pieces of uranium that smashed against each other at almost the speed of sound. It looked something like this. You have a projectile and a target both made of uranium-235. The projectile is where the majority of uranium is concentrated, about 60%, and the target with 40%. They are located on opposite ends of the bomb at a distance of 1.1 meters. When it's time to detonate, cordite powder bags are triggered, launching the projectile towards the target at 300 meters per second. Surrounding the target, tungsten carbide is used as a temper. This happens in a microsecond, releasing about 15 kilotons. This method is quite inefficient, as for the amount of uranium needed versus blast yield. Physicists define this as their yield-to-weight ratio. It is a simple calculation where you take the total energy released, in practice or in theory, divided by the total weight of the bomb. Little Boy had an yield-to-weight ratio of 3.6 kilotons per ton. In comparison, the Fat Man bomb had an yield-to-weight ratio of 4.6 kilotons per ton. The main problem with the ballistic method is that not enough neutrons remain in the reaction to increase blast yield. Now, the Fat Man bomb was a more complex device, however, far more efficient. With only 6.4 kilograms of plutonium, it was 40% stronger. In this case, they used a series of explosives projected inwards, compressing uranium-235 to twice its normal density, what they called radiation implosion. This is the reason this method is more efficient. The bomb was assembled in such a way to produce a symmetrical compression. To achieve this, they positioned high explosive charges in a classic soccer ball pattern, divided into three layers. Each of the three layers of explosives was designed to transform concave waves into a spherical one. The wave then causes the implosion of the aluminum pusher, crushing a boron plastic shell. This plastic shell was designed to prevent pre-detonation. The shock wave reaches a beryllium-polonium modulated neutron initiator, pushing the two metals together, releasing the first burst of neutrons from the center of the bomb, causing fission. 
Neutrons eventually reach the nickel-plated delta phase alloy of plutonium-239, 240 and gallium. The second fission reaction happens here, moving further outwards towards the natural uranium temper. Uranium not only fissions, but also works as a temper, reflecting back neutrons towards the center. This scheme uses significantly less filling and achieves a higher yield. But there is a major drawback. The blast waves have to be synchronized down to the microsecond. Any disturbance and the bomb yield drops dramatically. Now, how were they able to get 50 megatons? Well, the Tsar Bomba was created using radiation implosion as well, with a two-part multi-stage structure. The only difference is that they introduced something called a dry fuel, or lithium-6 deuteride. The first problem with hydrogen bombs lies with hydrogen itself. Hydrogen concentration has to be high enough to increase the chances of fusion. Lithium hydride is a solid soft material with salt-like characteristics. It is the perfect fuel for this type of use because of its high hydrogen content. Now, since detailed schematics aren't available, I will have to extrapolate things using the classic hydrogen bomb explanation with the teller ulm configuration. In this schematic, you have a fission bomb comprising the first stage, next to the second and third stage containing plutonium and lithium-6 deuteride. Not only it holds hydrogen in place, facilitating fusion, but lithium also breaks down, increasing blast yield. The Castle Bravo device contained large quantities of lithium-6 and 7, which were responsible for a 2.5 times increase in blast yield from 6 to 15 megatons. In the case of the most powerful bomb detonated, it released 50 megatons of TNT equivalent with an yield-to-weight ratio of 2 megatons per ton. At first, the Tsar Bomba was supposed to have a third stage capable of adding an extra 50 megatons. Now, it isn't clear if the bomb had all three stages when detonated. However, it is believed that the second and third stage of the bomb would have a lead temper instead of uranium-238, which decreased the bomb yield from 100 to 50 megatons. The ratio of the Tsar Bomba is only a fraction of what is possible in theory. But much higher values were achieved by US scientists. There is one bomb with a higher ratio, and that is the B-41, also known as the MK-41. A total of 500 were produced, and they hold the record for the most efficient, highest yield-to-weight ratio at 5.2 megatons per ton. The B-41 weighs only 4,840 kilograms. But if it weighs the same as the Tsar Bomba at 27 tons, this bomb would more than surpass the Tsar Bomba by a factor of almost three times at 140 megatons of TNT equivalent. But at the end of the day, though these bombs were extremely powerful, they weren't practical. Entire airplanes had to be dedicated to the bomb itself, severely limiting their maneuverability. Since war became more strategic and small scale, there was no need for these mega bombs, and smaller, more tactical nukes that could be delivered by rockets gained preference over time. Alright, folks, that's it. We're done here.